1998, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a piece for The New Yorker called The Pima Paradox, which is the big, first big review article about the obesity epidemic. And he said, you know, diet books say one thing, and the medical orthodoxy says something else, and the... Oh, it's a good idea, he said, to question the medical orthodoxy, but in this case, he ended up interviewing the experts and sided with the medical orthodoxy and basically siding with the idea that gluttony and sloth were the real causes of obesity, as we'll discuss. And then I came along three years later, and I had been writing a series of articles, investigative pieces for the science magazine, and then I basically did kind of the same piece Malcolm did for the New York Times magazine. And now it's 2001, and one of the primary differences, I mean, Malcolm and I have different trainings, he's a much better writer, um, but there are already researchers who are taking this unorthodox approach seriously and doing clinical trials, in particular, Eric Westman and Steve Finney and Jeff Volek and David Ludwig, and they were entertaining something seriously that I think had Malcolm actually met and talked to them, he would have entertained far more seriously as well. So it's just by virtue of coming across three years later and having people like David and, 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 and uh, Eric and Jeff and Steve who were studying this seriously at major men, clearly serious scientists, that a journalist like myself could come along and say, wait, let's take this other perspective seriously. So, getting into this lecture, I just wanted to bring this back. I've been giving a lot of talks lately, and I think we need a historical perspective to understand. Everything I do is in a historical perspective as a journalist, because to really, you know, to know what you're talking about, you have to know the history of your ideas, almost by definition. I don't see how you could know what you were talking about. And part of my, one, the one thing I brought to this field was I was able to go back at a point in time uh, new technology had become available, the internet, <laughs> that allowed me to do more research in five years than anyone had done 30, and basically to recreate the history of obesity, nutrition, chronic disease research, both from the medical texts and the conference proceedings. And <clears throat> do something no, and when, when you do something no one's ever done before, you see things nobody's ever seen. So I was lucky to be at the right place at the right time. So I have disclosures, book royalties, honoraria, CrossFit, bless their hearts, has been supporting me recently. Um, context, we know, Philippe just gave it, the obesity epidemic, which is terrifying, but it goes along with the diabetes epidemic, which is even more terrifying. If you go back to 1960, diabetes diagnoses in the United States have increased by 700 percent. And these epidemics are worldwide. They're everywhere in the world where a nation, a population shifts from eating whatever their traditional diet is and whatever quantity to the Western diet and lifestyle. So there's something about the Western diet and lifestyle that's triggering these epidemics, and it's vitally important we know what it is. And then, as you know, obesity is associated with a whole host of virtually every major chronic disease. Many of these we're going to talk about in the course of the next two days. So it's just vitally important to know what makes us fat. That's that simple. If this was any other epidemic and I had said that prevalence of the disease had increased 700% since 1960, there would be teams of scientists walking around the streets of San Francisco in you know, white overalls and fancy machines like Ghostbusters trying to figure out what it is we didn't understand about the disease. And in this case, we don't have people doing that because we think it's clear what causes this disease, and this is a conventional wisdom, the fundamental cause of obesity and overweight is an energy imbalance between calories consumed and calories expended. This is, this is the technical way you phrase this. If you're writing an article, if you're a group of scientists and you're writing in a scientific journal, in this case an endocrine society scientific statement, you say from a thermodynamic perspective it's clear that obesity is generally the consequence of small cumulative imbalances of energy intake and expenditure. This is the fundamental belief system, not just in obesity, but it actually extends to all of nutrition. If you go down many of our beliefs about what constitutes a healthy diet, you're going to end up with it based on this idea that you, when you're in weight maintenance, you're in calorie balance, there's a certain number of calories you need for that, and then everything else follows. So it's an energy balance disorder, calories in greater than calories out, we overeat. The biblical terms are gluttony and sloth, it hasn't changed much, and if you wanted to draw it as a hypothesis, it looks like this. Uh, too far away. 
Too much food, too little physical activity leads to overeating, energy in greater than energy out, and the result is obesity and the obesity epidemic. And this is a bedrock idea in the field, and if I was speaking to uh, medical grand rounds, of which I've given a couple dozen over the past 10 years, 90% of the people in the audience would believe this is true. But it's a hypothesis. And you can ask the question with any hypothesis, this is science, it's like, what's the evidence for and against? And what's interesting about this one is there are always immediate um, failures of the hypothesis. There are always clear reasons to distrust this eat too much theory of hypothesis. And one of them was in some of the poorest nations in the world, in some of the poorest periods in our nation, people would come from elsewhere and find strange evidence of high levels of obesity. In this case, Hilda Brook, a young German pediatrician, comes to the U.S. in 1933, moving with, flees the, the Nazi party in Germany, moves to Boston, then in 34 moves to New York, and is walking around the streets of New York in the single worst year of the Depression. The very worst year of the Depression, 40% of the nation is out of work, it's bread lines and soup kitchens, and she's stunned by how fat the children are. And she actually opens the first pediatric obesity clinic at Columbia University, the first in the nation, the first probably in the world, because she has to study pediatric obesity because she can't figure out why these kids can be so fat when there's so little food to be had. 1968, George McGovern is holding a, conf a, a, a conference to deal with hunger in America, and he's got people from all over the country, poor, impoverished people from all over the country, coming in to testify about how they're starving. And one of his colleagues on the panel says, George, this is ridiculous. These people aren't suffering from malnutrition. They're all overweight. So you've got this dual or double burden of obesity and malnutrition in nation after nation after nation in the world. This is just a screenshot from my Dropbox folder on the dual burden. And you can see virtually every poor nation in the world has got starving, stunted, malnourished children in association with obesity, usually older women and the pre predominantly older women. How do you explain that if you're going to blame this on eating too much or the food system bringing too much food to these people or McDonald's or Burger Kings? These people don't have McDonald's or Burger Kings. So how do you explain it? And when you have a hypothesis, you would like it to explain everything, ideally. So origins and context, what's fascinating about this hypothesis, and something you have to understand about science in general, this is a critically important idea about science. When you're pursuing science, the only thing you could learn, or what you learn is determined by the technology you have available to study a problem. So whatever your lab, has in terms of technology, that's what you can study, that's what you can measure, those are the questions you can ask about and the answers you get, and you end up with hypotheses that are very much technology dependent. So modern nutrition begins in the late 1800s, 1860s, in Germany and Austria with the invention of this device, which is a room-sized calorimeter that allows people, for the first time ever, the biochemists slash nutritionists, to measure the energy expended by large animals or humans, a dog in this case, over the course of time. So for a century, we knew how to measure the energy in food, the calorie content, and now for the first time, you can measure the calorie expenditure of humans. And for the next 60 years, all of nutrition science all of nutrition science is measuring calories in and calories out, measuring mineral and vitamin content and deficiencies, looking at protein and fiber. These are the things you can study. So you end up with a hypothesis. So while this is happening, researchers are working out the laws of thermodynamics and applying it, find, proving that it applies to humans. So by the early 1900s, you end up with a hypothesis that's completely technology dependent. And the technology is, well, we can't figure out how vitamins and minerals and fi well, fiber comes into this later. Protein might play a role in excess fat accumulation. But calories in and calories out sounds obvious, particularly in this context of thermodynamics. So Carl von Norden, who's one of the leading authorities, in, uh, leading German uh, authorities in diabetes, in the early 1900s puts forth a hypothesis of obesity that's effectively identical to what we have today, which is the ingestion of a quantity of food greater than that required by the body leads to an accumulation of fat into obesity should the disproportion be continued over a considerable period. And he's putting this forth because they could measure the energy that people eat and they can measure the energy that people expend, and that's what nutrition science is. <laughs>
a hundred years ago. Lewis Newberg is a University of Michigan physiologist who comes along in the 1920s, does some interesting work in diabetes with actually ketogenic diets to treat diabetes, and then by the 1930s gets interested in obesity and decides, based on Hilda Brooks' work with children, that all obese persons are alike in one fundamental respect, they literally overeat. Okay, so they take in more calories than they expend, and therefore obesity is caused either by a perverted appetite, which is a fancy way of saying eating too much, or a lessened outflow of energy, which is insufficient expenditure. <clears throat> so with Newberg, you have the first real, well, von Norden gets credit back in that era, and then Newberg takes it over and takes it forward from the 1930s on, and the American researchers that we'll see are qu quoting Newberg. So what's interesting with this theory is that both eating too much, perverted appetite, insufficient expenditure are basically behaviors. Sedentary behavior is a behavior. <clears throat> so you've got a theory that hypothesizes that people's weight problems are caused by defective behaviors, and then since obesity is such a burden, it's such a cruel uh, disorder to be burdened with, you have to ask the question, why don't people change their behavior, okay? And why don't they eat less or exercise more? And as we'll see, we're not talking about, you don't have to do it a lot in this theory to change behavior. And so now Newberg says, because they suffer from various human weaknesses, such as overindulgence and ignorance. And I don't like to show photos of researchers normally, but I show this photo of Newberg, because it's easy for somebody who looks like Newberg to think that obese people, people with obesity, <laughs> <clears throat> are overindulgent and ignorant. Newberg assuredly thinks that he eats in moderation. He may even think back then he exercises, but I doubt it. So he assumes, this is the, if everyone ate in moderation, they would be lean too. Look at me, I am lean, I eat in moderation, therefore, logical sophistry, but that's how we think, therefore, if everyone was lean, they too. If everyone ate in moderation, they too would be lean, and then you have to ask, well, they're not lean, so clearly if I told them this is how they were supposed to eat, they either don't care or they're too stupid to care. So you have this hypothesis of full body energy balance, and you put the cause in the brain. Ignorance, self-indulgence, gluttony, and sloth. That, this is the reason why I hate this hypothesis. This is my white whale, and the Ahab is my... Okay, and the funny thing is, if you... <laughs> If you look at the same thing today, same hypothesis today, there's a lot of fancy language, there's a lot of neurobiologists working on this, there's a lot of functional MRI studies done. Ultimately, you have the same causes, the problem is in the brain, and the brain works by mediating energy expenditure and intake. That's the theory today, that's the food reward theory or the neurocognitive neurobiological award, but it still puts the problem in the brain. There's no place in this theory, I should have a red line there around energy expenditure, where you could look and ask the simple question, what's going on when fat is mobilized and moved around the body? We have a disorder of excess fat accumulation. Why aren't we talking about all those variable ones biological systems that evolved to move fat around the body, store it, make it available, make it mobilized, make it oxidized. We don't. The, the ultimate reason, and when I was doing my research for good calories, bad calories, I interviewed virtually every major figure in the field, and basically they believe that it's an eating too much Sedentary behavior problem in part because of people like Falstaff. I mean, clearly, if Falstaff got fat because he doesn't live in moderation, then there are, the world is full of people who get fat because they don't live in moderation. They don't care. And a lot of people still believe this, even people in this room. And then you starve people. They lose weight, and I probably a dozen times in the course of 600 interviews, I heard somebody say there are no fat people in Auschwitz. Is that somehow implied that if there were fat people in Auschwitz, they got there by eating too much? So one thing we never discuss in any of this is the size of the effect. So you'll read entire articles about obesity without fat accumulation, excess fat accumulation, without discussing the size of the effect. Vitally important to know how big an effect you're trying to explain, because if you don't know that, you can't explain it. Okay? And the CDC tells us weight management is all about calorie balance, so what kind of calorie balance are we talking about? And if you ask this question, one way I think about it now, like for instance, <clears throat> when I was a senior in high school, I was six foot two and weighed 195 pounds and played football. And when my brother was a senior in high school, he was six foot two and weighed 195 pounds and played football. This was our senior year maximum weight. I eventually grew to be 240. <laughs> 
although I'm going to make it 235 for the thing. And he never got above 195. So I put on 40 pounds in 20 years that he didn't gain. The question is, what did I have to do? How was my body, what was my body doing that his body wasn't? Okay, I'm gaining two pounds a year that he's not. A pound of fat is roughly 3,500 calories of fat. To simplify this equation, we're going to say that this is all fat, even though it's not. And here's the equation. Two times 3,500, two pounds, times 3,500 calories per pound of fat over 365 days in a year. I was storing roughly 20 calories in my fat tissue that my brother wasn't. 20 calories a day in my fat tissue that my brother wasn't, okay? Um, and fat cells, the 30, 40, 50 billion of them, 20 calories spread out between 10x billion fat cells. That's two almonds, no, excuse me, two peanuts, three almonds, four olives, two gummy bears worth of calories. <laughs> um, you can ask this question, the average American consumes about 2,700 calories a day. That was a 0.00% energy balance, imbalance. How can we possibly, how can we possibly, I'm going to get back to that question. Let's ask a different question. The average American is now 30 years heavier than he was in 1960. That's the obesity epidemic, 30 pounds of excess weight. It's about half a pound a year. That's five calories a day. It's a 0.002 positive energy balance, 0.002. Half a gummy bear. <laughs> stored in our fat tissue that lean people are not storing. That's the difference. Half a gummy bear distributed among 30, 40 billion fat cells per person. Eugene Dubois, I first saw this calculation done in Eugene Dubois, who's a leading authority on metabolism in the U.S. pre-World War II. His textbook was a seminal textbook on metabolism. He did the same calculation for the very same reason. He said, these are infinitesimal numbers we're talking about. And there's no stranger phenomenon than the maintenance of a constant body weight under marked variation in bodily activity and food consumption. Somebody who thinks that the brain is manipulating the body such that it can prevent a 0.007% energy balance has some really perverse sense of how organisms evolve, that there's a computer up here. Maybe Google could do it. You know, that's constantly measuring input and expenditure and doing these infinitesimal manipulations. How could this be possible? So there are always other shortcomings of the hypothesis. You do clinical trials of eating less, the way the results are so small as to be in clinically insignificant. You do clinical trials of exercising more, increasing physical activity, because this is a balance and that doesn't help either. So far, data to support this hypothesis are not particularly compelling. That was the American Heart Association, the American College of Sports Medicine, in a joint physical activity guideline in 2007, trying to get us all to work out, and yet acknowledging that there was virtually no evidence that working out influences body weight. If you look at genetics, and I'm going to use photos from pre-World War II German and Austrian textbooks, okay, because I'm going to get back to this pre-World War II hypothesis of obesity. Um, back then, they thought it was vitally important to have photos of obese individuals in the textbooks and to study obese individuals, not just obese animals or obese rats, or just measure whether somebody has a BMI over 30 or a BMI under 30. If you look at people and where they get fat and when they get fat, you start to learn about why they get fat. So that's what we want to know. We want to know about the fattening process, because what we have is a disorder of excess fat accumulation. And so, for starters, obesity clearly has a huge genetic component. You see studies reporting that today and articles reporting it today. It was first calculated in the 1930s by Julius Bauer. It's, it's, strong a genetic component is height or eye color or anything else. And the point of this photo was not just to these lean twins on the left and right, obese twins on the right, not... They, have this, they don't just look alike. Identical twins don't just have the same faces, they have the same body types. Body types run in family. Fat accumulation runs in family. These obese women in this photo have ex identical <laughs> bodies despite being, say, 100 pounds overweight. So the question is not just what determines whether they, why they accumulated 100 excess pounds. Why did it go to the same place in both the identical twins? What, can, what controls where the fat goes? This is important, the question of how much. Sexual variations, men and women fatten differently. Men fatten above the waist, women fatten below the waist. When women, men fatten above the waist, they double their risk of heart disease. The women don't. 
So the question is, the energy balance hypothesis tells us nothing about why the women got fat below the waist and the men got fat above the waist. It tells us nothing about why the men doubled the risk of heart disease and the women didn't. And we would like a hypothesis that would explain something as simple as where the fat goes. Puberty. Boys and girls enter puberty with roughly the same amount of body fat. Okay? As they go through puberty, boys get bigger, which means they take in more calories than they expend. And they get taller, and they actually lose fat and gain muscle, and the girls gain fat, and they gain fat in very specific places. And when they get out of puberty, the girls have roughly 50% more fat on their body than the boys. Okay? And the girls, too, got bigger and taller and took in more energy than they expended. We know this because they got more massive. So the question is, why did the boys lose fat and gain muscle, and why did the girls gain fat and gain fat in specific places? And why is it that for women, you could say that puberty is an obesogenic, or at least an adipogenic phenomenon, because they get fatter, but the boys get more muscular, and clearly sex hormones are intimately involved in the process of both muscle and fat accumulation, and endocrinologists knew this since the 1920s, or earlier but obesity researchers didn't care. The fatal flaw with the energy balance hypothesis ultimately is a simple one, okay? It's a tautology. Remember this, the fundamental cause of obesity and overweight is an energy imbalance between counts. You can write that on the website of the World Health Organization and be taken seriously, okay? Let's assume we had the identical logic and we were discussing wealth disparities and you had this line on the World Economic Forum. The fundamental cause of wealth is a money imbalance between dollars earned and dollars spent. They're logically identical. If somebody gets wealthy, if Bill Gates gets wealthy, we can be pretty confident he took in more money than he spent. And Warren Buffett took in more money than he spent. The joke is, I took in more money than I spent, and I'm not wealthy. So it doesn't tell us much. It doesn't actually tell us anything. We don't know why Bill Gates got well. We don't know how to emulate what Bill Gates does. We don't know why Warren Buffett got wealthy. We don't know what I did, and you don't want to emulate that. I mean, <laughs> it is a tautology. Literally, if somebody got wealthier, therefore they took in more money than they spent, but they didn't get wealthy because they took in more money than they spent. Taking in more money than they spent is a condition of getting wealthier. Okay, the same exact same thing is true for obesity. If somebody got fatter or taller or more muscular, they took in more, more energy than they expended. If they got constipated, they took in more energy than they expended. Okay, but none of that tells you anything about the cause. And for a hundred years, we embraced a hypothesis that had no causal information embedded in it. It's supposed to explain obesity, and it's another way of saying somebody got fatter without being specific about whether it was fat or muscle or bone or fecal matter, which is what it was worth. Dollars in greater than dollars out. Okay, so in the course of my research, I realized, luckily, that there was an alternative hypothesis, which is... Stunning, I had no idea about this. And it was a pre-World War II German-Austrian hypothesis. And one of the things I learned in the course of being an amateur historian is that medical science pre-World War II was at its single at the apex in Germany and Austria, basically. And the medical, the language, the, the lingua franca of medical science pre-World War II was German. If you wanted to do serious medical science pre-World War II, you had to read German, and ideally you spoke German so you could go train with these hair professor doctor types who actually understood science. And just like in physics, where every major physicist of the first half of the 20th century was a German or an Austrian or a European with people with names that you would recognize like Planck and Heisenberg and, and Einstein and Bohr and, I mean, all Europeans with a couple of exceptions. In America, the same was true in medicine, except we don't remember these people because we wanted nothing to do with these people post-war. Post-war physics, we wanted a lot to do with these people because they knew how to build bombs. But the Actually, the Ivy League universities post-World War II had policies in place, very similar to the policies they have place, place now, to keep out Jewish students and Jewish emigre researchers from Europe. And so these people just weren't embraced, their ideas weren't embraced. A few of them got positions and did great things, like Hans Krebs, but many of them vanished into obscurity. And many of them ended up in Israel, which is one reason why the Israeli medicine is so good, considering the population. So this alternative hypothesis, obesity is sort of excess fat accumulations. It's not energy balance or overeating or sedentary behavior. It's first principles. 
Somebody walks into your office, they weigh 400 pounds, you shouldn't be thinking about how much they eat or exercise. You're wondering why do they have 200 excess pounds of fat? It's a fat accumulation disorder. And in this case, gluttony and sloth are compensatory effects, they're not causes. So in effect, we flip the arrow of causality on this first law of thermodynamics. So conventional wisdom says this is delta E, the change in energy in a system is equal to the energy in minus the energy out. It's like saying the change in wealth of a system is equal to money in minus money out. The conventional wisdom is you change E in and E out, and that will change energy storage. So you eat too much and you don't compensate by exercising more, you get fat. That's a conventional logic. The alternative hypothesis says, wait, energy storage, like everything else in the human body, is incredibly well regulated. It had to be regulated. We lived in a world, we still live in a world, where the amount of energy we have available, both in storage and for immediate use, is vitally important to our survival as a species. We don't leave that to chance, or the idea that maybe there's going to be 10 good years, and we're all going to look like the people from that Disney movie, the name Pixar, sorry. Okay, I'm rushing of the clock. So this hypothesis says you change, you dysregulate energy storage, it's going to affect intake and expenditure. So make somebody store more calories as fat, they're going to be hungrier, or they're going to be sedentary. Intake and expenditure are going to change if you change storage. Um, I'm going to skip this because I don't think I have time. We could come back to it because it's a terrific thought experiment. So this was a German-Austrian hypothesis pre-World War II. The leading uh, proponents were Gustav von Bergmann, who was a leading authority in clinical medicine in Germany in the first half of the 20th century. Today, the most prestigious award by the German Society of Internal Medicine is the Gustav von Bergmann Medal. This man was no quack. And then Julius Bauer, who was a pioneer in uh, endocrinology, genetics, and chronic disease research at the University of Vienna, a very famous endocrinologist, when the University of Vienna was one of the great universities in the world. Um, this is how Bauer described this hypothesis in a paper in 1941. Um, he uses this term lipophilia, which I'm going to have to describe. Lipophilia means love of fat. And what they needed was a term to describe the characteristics of a tissue, whether or not it would accumulate fat or not, because clearly, if you care about something other than just BMI, you can see that different tissues have different affinities to accumulate fat. So when I say men accumulate fat around the waist, the world is full of these men with pot bellies and spin, you know, skinny little legs. And the question is, even if they're taking in more energy than they consume, why does the fat go here and not there? And these guys would say, well, because the, the weight, the tissue around the stomach is lipophilic. They don't know what constitutes lipophilia, but it's a way to describe a tissue. And then they would say if different tissues could be more lipophilic, like feel your foreheads or look at the back of your hands. We don't accumulate fat there. We do know where we accumulate fat. Everyone in the room probably knows that. But I'll tell you, we don't accumulate fat there, so there's something different with the tissue. And the phrase they used was lipophilia. So Bauer said, like a malignant tumor like the fetus, the uterus or the breasts of a pregnant woman, the abnormal lipophilic tissue seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition. So which is interesting, now we can begin to explain the dual burden, right? Because we don't need overnutrition to get obesity. We only need malnutrition. It maintains its stock and may increase it independent of the requirements of the organism. A sort of anarchy exists. The adipose tissue lives for itself, does not fit into the precisely regulated management of the whole organism. A lipomatous subject may die of starvation and still remain lipomatous. The way I think of that is you could take a basset hound and starve it. You don't end up with a greyhound. You end up with a starved basset hound. And then the question is, what? <clears throat> Okay, some things work, some don't. Um, by the late 1930s, this hormonal regulatory hypothesis of obesity had been pretty much accepted in Europe and well accepted in the US. Researchers were thinking seriously about obesity. And the interesting thing is there's only maybe half a dozen to a dozen people thinking about obesity from a research perspective. We're taking it seriously. So Russell Wilder, the Mayo Clinic, leading authority on diabetes, he would leave the Mayo Clinic in the early 40s to be the first administrator of the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Academy of Sciences. 
The effect after meals of withdrawing from the circulation, even a little more fat than usual, might well account both for the delayed sense of satiety and for the frequently abnormal taste for carbohydrate encountered in obese persons. A slight tendency in this direction would have a profound effect in the course of time. Slight tendency, remember, it's only got to be 5, 10, 20 calories a day. That's it. The hypothesis deserves attentive consideration. Hugo Rone, who wrote the lead, the first, uh, he was a Norwegian, uh, Norwegian, Hungarian emigre who went to work at Northwestern in the 1920s, wrote the first monograph on obesity and leanness in the U.S. in 1940. This is theories more or less fully accepted, chiefly in Germany. And then it vanishes. It just vanishes. It's fascinating. Remember, I said the lingua franca of medicine shifts from German to English. Post-war, there's a very strong anti-German sentiment in the U.S., and you can actually see it vanish in the literature. I'm going to show this to you. So Bauer, in 1941, writes this paper that I quoted, which is published in Annals of the Medicine. He says, that, and he spends the first half of the paper debunking the energy balance hypothesis of Newberg. The current energy theory of obesity, which considers only an imbalance between intake of food and expenditure, is unsatisfactory. It's a distribution of energy in the body, too, which counts. I was actually, my photos are basically based on Bauer's paper. The adipose tissue is not merely a passive storing place, but a living and active part of the body with its own physiologic and pathologic processes. An increased appetite with a subsequent imbalance between intake and output of en energy is a consequence of the abnormal analog. Analog is one of these German terms that kind of means genetic predisposition rather than the cause of obesity. The next year, Newberg writes his own paper, 60 pages instead of 20. It's like two bloggers fighting now, except it takes a year in this case, instead of a week. And in the 60-page paper in which he's arguing basically his gluttony and sly, he spends a page in which he spends a paragraph debunking Bauer. The suggestion of von Bergman so volubly defended by Bauer that the fat cells of obese persons possess an abnormally great avidity for fat and an exaggerated capacity for retaining it finds no support, no support. In experiments designed to test its validity, bodybuilders inherited, obesity is not. We hear the same lines today. Bodybuild is inherited where the fat goes, but not obesity. This is a citation record. Bauer's paper on the bottom was referenced 10 times between 1941 and 1959. This is a period in the 1940s, there were maybe five to 10 papers being published a year on obesity. So these are not... But Newberg's papers are cited steadily through the late 1970s. Two papers. Um, Newberg became, in the 1950s, he was the one researcher whose career spanned the war years. He became, in the 1950s, sort of the god of obesity. And you would see in conference proceedings young doctors saying, well, Newberg said this and Newberg said that, as though it couldn't be questioned. This hypothesis, that stunted green line for Bauer's paper at the bottom, Ten references in 20 years is the death of a hypothesis. Not because it was wrong, but because it was unfashionable. The weird thing is, beginning in the late 1930s, researchers start creating animal models of obesity. The first one is uh, the lesion, ventromedial, uh, lesions in the ventromedial hypothalamus in the late 1930s at the Northwestern University. And every single one of these animal models confirms this hormonal regulatory. By, and by that I mean you can do whatever you want to the animal to make it fat. You could surgically lesion its brain, you could create a genetic thing, whatever you want to the animal, work with genetic strains, and if you calorie restrict them, they would get fat anyway. This is how Jean Mayer put it in 1968 about its strain of fat mice he was studying at Harvard. He says these mice will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starved. So they don't get fat because they eat too much, they get fat if they eat at all. You could think of obese animals and obese humans, and people who get fat eating the same diet that other animals and people stay lean on. That's the problem when they tell us we should eat fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and all that. They're telling us we should eat like they do. Lean people are telling fat people we should eat like they do because then we would be lean also. And we're saying we used to eat like you do. And we got fat. That's why we had to change what we eat. Anyway.
Okay, if obesity is a sort of excess accumulation of fat, a hormonal regulatory disorder, the question is what regulates fat accumulation? It's an obvious question. It should be the very first question anyone studying obesity would ask. This is what Hilda Brooks said in 1957. Again, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just channeling smarter people than I am. Looking at obesity without preconceived ideas, one would assume that the main trend of research should be directed towards an examination of abnormalities of the fat metabolism, since by definition, excessive accumulation of fat is the underlying abnormality. It so happens that this is the era in which the least work has been done. That was 1957. In 1973, when she wrote a book on uh, anorexia, which had become her area of expertise, she pointed out that now that the work had been done, there was no discussion of it in the literature. It was as though the obesity people didn't care, even though they had now learned what regulates fat metabolism. And basically, this was a lesson, and this too took two new technologies to, to do. It required an assay to measure fatty acids in the bloodstream that was discovered in 1956, and it required a way to measure hormone levels accurately in the bloodstream that was published in 1960 by Solomon Yalo and Solomon Burson and Rosalind Yalo. And Yalo would later win the Nobel Prize for this assay, and the Nobel Committee would say that this created a revolution in endocrinology and medicine, and the revolution passed by the field of obesity. In part because that, by that time, the 1960s, obesity research was dominated by psychiatrists and psychologists who were convinced obesity was an eating disorder and were working to try and figure out how to get fat people to eat less. And even if they could read an endocrinology textbook or a metabolism paper, they didn't care. It wasn't their thing. And that was obesity research. It's fascinating, this history, because you can see how fashions determine reality in science. By 1965, Yalo and Burson said this in their very first paper, insulin is the principal regulator of fat accumulation. Okay, and the diagram is the 2010 diagram from Keith Frayn's Metabolic Regulation textbook, just to show you that this, was, this didn't go away, it didn't turn out to be wrong. Suppression of fat mobilization, it's insulin, and as Yalo and Burson said, release of fatty acids from fat cells requires only the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. What are we doing? Okay. Ten minutes and ten minutes of questions. With luck. Okay, so here are the key points of fat cell regulation. When insulin is secreted or chronically elevated, fat accumulates in the fat tissue. This is textbook science. And then the, you can go to a textbook and you'll see that it's... When insulin levels drop, fat escapes from the fat tissue and the fat depots shrink, and we secrete insulin primarily in response to the carbohydrates of the diet. So none of those statements are controversial. They're all textbook science. George Cahill, who did a lot of this research in the late 50s and early 60s, and then co-authored an American Physiological Society 600-page compendium of the co-edited, a compendium on this research, as he described it to me, he said, carbohydrate is driving insulin, is driving fat. And the interesting thing is, if you take away the three words, so that's textbook science, but if you take away carbohydrate is driving insulin is driving fat, if you take away is driving insulin, you're left with carbohydrate is driving fat, which is the logical equivalent and is now quackery. Because if obesity is an energy balance disorder, the only way that foods can affect our fat accumulation is through their caloric content or the, what's left of their caloric content after digestion. But now we're saying carbohydrate is driving fat through a mechanism that's completely independent. So when we locked in our hypothesis of obesity, when all we could do was measure energy balance, we locked out everything that came after 100 years of medicine, which included the field of endocrinology and the hormonal regulation of fat accumulation and fat mobilization and fat lipolysis and everything else. Quick thing, I interviewed George, 2005 Cahill, when I said this, and I said, okay, George, if carbohydrates driving insulin is driving fat, why don't you come away from this era, 1965, with a hypothesis that if you reduce insulin, you reduce fat accumulation, so if you reduce carbohydrate, you'll reduce fat accumulation. And he said, because we know what's causing obesity. We don't need a hypothesis. And I took a deep breath and I said, what's that, George? And he said, sedentary behavior. <laughs> and then he told me a story about, I should go to the airport and I should look at who's on the escalator. It's the fat people. The thin people are walking up the steps. And 
we had a discussion about the role of hypotheses in science. And the alternative hypothesis, this is it. It's very simple. Like any growth defect, like any growth defect. Uh, you see somebody walking down the street who's eight feet tall, you're worried about growth hormones. You see somebody walking down the street, an adult, full height, four feet tall, you're worrying about growth hormones, receptors, and signaling molecules. Like any growth defect, obesity is a hormonal regulatory disorder, like type 2 diabetes, to which it's so closely associated that we think of type 2 diabetes and obesity as two sides of the same coin. It's fundamentally a disorder of insulin signaling, and it's triggered by the carb content of the diet. I mean, it's that's your hypothesis. It's a simple one, not all carbs in the sense that it's glycemic load and glycemic index and fructose content by different mechanisms. So the base of the food guide pyramid, which begins to explain maybe some of the obesity epidemic, and sweets. And then green leafy vegetables have a surprisingly low digestible carb content. So for most of us, or maybe virtually all of us, they would be benign. So here's the hypothesis. Refined, grain, refined grains, starches, and sugars cause dysregulation of insulin signaling, excess fat accumulation, obesity, and the obesity epidemic. It's a simple hypothesis. It's based on biology instead of physics. I would argue it should be the null hypothesis, but I'm not the one who matters. If you look at the implications, if you ask today the question, why do diets work, the conventional wisdom, this is a line from the latest addicts edition of the textbook of obesity, all diets of result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce total calorie intake. This alternative hypothesis say all diets of result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce circulating insulin and probably by restricting carbohydrates. Okay, so when a diet works, it's not because it got somebody to eat less, it's because it's got insulin low enough to mobilize fat, and we're going to talk briefly about the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. And there are a lot of ways you could do this. So you could lower insulin by calorie restricting somebody, which includes carbohydrate restriction and inevitably includes sugar restriction and beer restriction and Coca-Cola restriction and all of the most offending. You could do it with carbohydrate restriction, arguably without calorie restriction. You could do it with intermittent fasting, you could do it with fasting, maybe even carnivory is an extreme way to reduce insulin, and in that case, maybe increase glucagon. The conventional wisdom, the history, the conventional wisdom from the 1820s at least through the 1960s was that carbohydrates are fattening. Farinaceous is an old word for starchy. This is from Tanner, I quoted this line in every book I've written, I'm going to quote it again in my next one. This is one of the two leading British dietitians co-authoring an article on the British Journal of Nutrition, 1963. The first sentence is, every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. It's a piece of common knowledge which few nutritionists would dispute. When you look for diets for obesity, which I did in the late 1940s, early 1950s, I found them published in the medical literature by Harvard Medical School, Stanford Medical School, Columbia Medical, no, Cornell, Rush and one other I forget, and they were all identical to this one by Raymond Green, the leading, Raymond Green was the uh, leading authority on endocrinology in uh, uh, England in the mid 20th century, he was the brother of Graham Green, his textbook, The Practice of Endocrinology, this was a diet, this was always a diet. So foods to be avoided, we're not talking about how much. 30 grams or 5%, it's just, you don't eat these foods, bread, cereals, potatoes, sugar, sweets, and you can eat as much as you like of these foods. Like the foods to be avoided are literally fattening, even though they didn't know that. Why? They didn't have a mechanism, 1951. And you can eat as much of the rest because they are literally not fattening. If I don't want to get lung cancer, nobody cares about how much butter I eat, right? Because it's not carcinogenic. So that's, that was the logic, it was that simple. Don't eat these foods, do eat these foods. If you are predisposed to get fat, then there are indeed bad foods and good foods, and you could eat as much as you want. So here's the catch. This was the problem along. Why such a drastic diet? Because this evolved with the help of Atkins into the ketogenic diet, even though the doctors who preceded Atkins were just telling people do not eat carbohydrates and pointing out that they gained their weight loss stopped when they ate any, so they were clearly in ketosis. Atkins took this to a ketogenic diet. His diet was ketogenic, ketones and ketosis were his magic sauce. And he had you measure ketones with ketone strips, 
And if you got add, and you could add carbs back as long as you stayed in ketosis. And so Atkins didn't know this. There's a lot of things he didn't know. He was just a cardiologist. <laughs> um, this was uh, Ralph DeFranzo's lab at um, UT San Antonio. Again, we have a technology issue. There were only a few labs in the country in the 1980s and 1990s that could measure insulin resistance and insulin levels in the blood. And DeFranzo had pioneered this technology so his lab could do it. So they looked at how fatty acid mobilization, lipolysis and oxidation, fatty acid turnover changed as insulin levels drop. So you read this graph from the left to the right. Insulin levels are dropping and you see fatty acid turnover doesn't... Basically, your fat is storing fat as insulin levels are coming down. And the phrase that would be used, the same phrase that the Franzo company used, adipose tissue is exquisitely sensitive to insulin. So if there's even a little bit of insulin in the blood, it inhibits the liberation, the mobilization, the lipolysis of fat from that fat cell. And then it gets to a threshold, the purple spot, and you get below the threshold, and it's very low, and your fat tissue dumps fat out of the bloodstream, but dumps fat out of the fat cell into the bloodstream and your lean tissue starts mobilizing it for fuel. And if you are below that threshold, you are mobilizing fat and oxidizing, and if you're above that threshold, you're basically storing fat. And that threshold, and I talked to Steve Finney about this, and we probably differ a little, but it's effectively, if you're down there, you know you're losing fat. It's that simple, and you're probably in ketosis. And you've got to be down there or you're not. And some of us are so sensitive to insulin that the only way we get down there is to get rid of all carbs. And that's the logic behind the ketogenic diet or the very low-carb, high-fat diet, is you get rid of all carbs to make sure you're below that threshold because we don't know where it is. Just, uh, it's interesting, and then I'm going to, that will take some questions. The AMA went after Atkins. Uh, they didn't like the high-fat nature of the diet. They didn't like his attitude. They didn't like him. They didn't like that he was making a lot of money. They being Ted Van Italy and uh, Phil White of Harvard, two people under the... Um, and they were scared of ketosis, as all doctors tend to be because of diabetic ketoacidosis. So in this paper in which they critique Atkins' paper, they say fat is mobilized when insulin secretion diminishes, which is true, and yet low-carbohydrate diets are a bizarre concept of nutrition that should not be promoted to the public as if they were established scientific principles when a low-carbohydrate diet is effectively designed to diminish insulin secretion. So, the 1970s, they wanted to get rid of Atkins. Atkins was the bathwater. They had to get rid of the baby. The baby was the hormonal or enzymatic regulation of fat metabolism. And they did it. By the 1980s, it was gone. It's still gone. That Endocrine Society paper that I quoted from, which was 30-odd pages long on obesity pathogenesis, had, in effect, a few paragraphs on hormonal regulation of fat metabolism because they were addressing my work to say that it was wrong. And everything else is about how the brain regulates hunger and appetite. Anyway, thank you very much. I've got 9 minutes and 21 seconds for questions. Thank you. Thank you for the great start to the conference. Oh, I'm Betsy McMichael. I'm a family nurse practitioner and regional director of operations for Jumpstart MD. I have the fun pleasure of keeping us within time. Okay, so we don't we'll get started on the question and answer session. Um, as a friendly reminder, 10 minutes, 9 minutes now. Uh, for anyone interested, please line up on either side of the stage where we have a microphone okay. on the left and the right. This can evolve, so if needed, I can pass this microphone out as well. If you're stuck in the middle somewhere, we can make it work. Um, and as a reminder, please speak into the microphone so that we can record uh, and that everybody can hear you in the room. If we run out of time and have lots of questions, please meet with the speakers in the hallways or at happy hour tonight uh, or over dinner. So with that, please get started. Thank you so much. Uh, are you aware of anybody that's doing work for an antibody against insulin similar to antibodies against TNF alpha and rheumatoid arthritis or anything like that? I don't, but it would be, have to be an insulin. That, I, insulin is such a fundamental hormone that if you try to block it somewhere, you're going to end up with problems, serious problems somewhere else. I mean, that's the argument for the dietary therapy here is you could get rid of the trigger of whatever's 
keeping insulin too long, too high, but if you try to target it, and I'm sure may, by now I hope the pharmaceutical industry is, although when I was writing Good Calories, Bad Calories, and I talked to very good obesity researchers in the pharma industry, they were still going after our hunger. Um, anyway, if you try to target, so I do not, but I would be very pessimistic and I would not buy stock. <laughs> Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, we do see in the research fairly extensive neuro alterations in chronic consumers of processed foods. So do you think in addition to the insulin mechanism, there might be an addictive mechanism at work? Uh, well, I have children, so yes. Um, <laughs> the, uh, What's interesting is a whole other way of thinking about the insulin mechanism that thinks of basically hunger as being a response to fuel availability, hunger and cravings, and so addiction as being a response to fuel availability in the periphery, and maybe perhaps particularly the liver. And so while there, I'm assuredly, well, I would expect to see changes in the brain, um, that might reflect addiction and might reflect, but for instance, just cephalic phase insulin secretion, which is somebody nobody really talks about that much, although there was a theory on this in the 1980s. Oh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Lustig is going, <laughs> going to talk about cephalic phase insulin secretion, but the gist of it would be quickly, I think about food. Hot beignets, folks, hot beignets. Think about that. Everybody in this room has now secreted insulin. <laughs> okay? And they've, that insulin is beginning to empty their circulation of available fuels. Their, you know, blood sugar is being taken up, their fat is being stored, and they're getting hungry. They may even be, anyone salivating? <laughs> so it's sort of, if but you do, have an addiction... Do you think that also created a dopamine release? Well, that's the thing. So the brain's going to respond to that. But to think of it as centrally mediated as opposed to peripherally mediated without... So one of the problems in this whole field is we had people just thought it's the brain. Everything is the brain and that's what they studied and they never considered the possibility that the brain is responding to physiological signals mm -hmm. and that you can't really understand what's happening. So if I say they're addictive mechanisms, those addictive mechanisms are just a response to a comp to what's happening in the brain. They may even evolve over time and you would have all these things, but without understanding what's happening in the periphery, you'll never solve the problem. Right. So uh, one of the things that fascinates me and probably Rob Lustig is that both you know, fructose and alcohol are uh, metabolized in the liver. Mm -hmm. And is that a coincidence in how our brains respond to them? Right. Okay. If they respond the same, which is of course an open question. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a few more minutes, in theory. Can you do the, talk about the basketball study that you said you didn't have oh. time to do that was fascinating? Yeah, if we can uh, bring this up. Can we get that back, my slides? <clears throat> Thank you. While we're trying to get that back, question. Well, I've been living in this low-carb communication bubble for maybe five years now, so I'm curious about how much that message has permeated the general knowledge, you know, and out, out in the world of real people. <laughs> um, and it's a good question. The answer is, it's really hard to say. Like, clearly keto is a huge fad now. In a worrisome fad, because clearly a lot of people are doing it who don't need to lose weight and are doing it because they think it'll... Uh, who knows what, and they'll probably stop doing it fairly soon, and then it'll be really seen as a fad. Um, I look for signs all the time. So there's a, when, we, when I started this in the late, in 2000, there were half a dozen, maybe a dozen physicians in the U.S. prescribing very low-carb diets, you know, and half of them are in this room. And Today, there are thousands to tens of thousands. It's hard to quantify because you don't know what proportion, what tip of the iceberg you're seeing, or are you seeing the whole iceberg? Um, I saw there was recently, uh, like I have friends in the veterinarian community, and apparently something like, you know, 15 or 20 percent of all pet food sold now is low-carb or paleo pet food. <laughs> so it suggests that, you know, people who may have no reason to be dogmatic may be catching on. 
in a way, and my own pet store in Berkeley is stocked with just shelf after shelf of all, you know, no grain, no carb cat food, and it's not because I live there. Um, <laughs> so it's spreading, but they, they equally well, there's a, the vegan vegetarian movement is very powerful and very well centralized in major institutions of higher learning, um, one of which I regret to say I have a degree from. And um, so, and they, this challenges them in a way that makes them challenge us back, because obviously the easiest way to do these, to eat, to keep insulin low is to, to animal products. And so I understand their dismay, but as that grows, this is marginalized more as fad. And then the, the science out there is pretty bad in general, and the journalism out there is worse in general. And so, you know, it's just, I gave the lecture I gave at Ohio State, the end of the lecture was basically, we, you know, the, the line from uh, Cool Hand Luke, uh, you know, what we have here is a failure to communicate, and we just have to keep trying to communicate, and it's an endless job. But, um, you know, and we're definitely making progress. I mean, what's happened is amazing. It's just hard to tell what percentage of the population it is, and then we tend to live in informed, well-educated areas, and it's probably very different in places where they drink sweet tea. Um, let me go over this growth, this analogy very quickly, because this is interesting. Just, this is to show you the different way of thinking about obesity. So the fellow in the middle of this photo is Carl Anthony Towns. This was his senior year in college at Kentucky. Uh, he's a center for the Kentucky Wildcats, who was drafted number one in the draft. He went on to the Minnesota Timberwolves, where he's been starring for them more or less, depending on what you think of his level of play. This New York Times did an article about him his senior year and his, his year at Kentucky, and they described he went through a growth spurt in college, in high school. So they described that during his growth spurt, they said there just never seemed to be enough food to satiate Towns' growing body. After school, he would eat a foot-long sub before his mother's home-cooked dinners, even after having a hefty lunch of homemade chicken, rice, and vegetables, and his favorite snacks, granola bars and bunch of crunch. So if this kid had Prader-Willi syndrome, you would say this was hyperphagia, and this was you know, causing his obesity. So this is technical definition of hyperphagia, which is, you know, excessive consumption of food, starvation. So what, we, what I did was a thought experiment where I, I gave Carl Anthony a, a paternal twin brother, well, fraternal. So Carl Anthony is seven feet, he's 250 pounds, he's got this amazing voracious appetite, but he had it because he was going through a growth spurt in high school. Remember? So, in our hypothesis, his BMI was only 25. So he was eating that much, he was starving all the time because he was growing. Change in energy stores changed his intake. So as his body was trying to grow, he was starving all the time, right? I mean, our kids go through puberty, they eat us out of house and home, they lie around the house all day long, there are all these compensatory effects to their bodies needing the energy. And then here's Carl Anthony's fraternal twin brother, Anthony Carl, who's a foot shorter. He's the exact same weight. His BMI is 34, and with Anthony Carl, we flip the causality. So he ate just as much as Carl Anthony had to because he was hungry also all the time and he was growing. So here's Carl Anthony, change in energy stores, drives intake and expenditure. This is what we know to be true for every growth phenomena. And here's Anthony Carl, what we assume to be true for obesity, we flip it. And all we're saying is if someone is predisposed, if their body is trying to get fat, it will make them hungry. If you starve them, it will cause cravings and they will binge eat, just like normal human beings. I could starve Anthony, Carl Anthony, I could starve him in college and stunt his growth, and in the middle of that growth spurt and I'll have a miserable, starving, emaciated kid who's still trying to grow. And the idea is the same is true of obesity. That's all the Germans and Austrians were saying. The same, you drive them to accumulate fat, they're going to be hungry, or they're going to be sedentary because they're losing calories into their fat tissue. Anyway, thank you. Thanks.